Welcome to our video on the fabrication of standard steel trusses. These are typically trusses with double angle uh, top cords and bottom cords and usually they are parallel cord steel trusses. Uh, the web members may be made out of rods, single angles, or double angles depending on the depth of the truss, the length of the members, and the magnitude of the forces on the truss. So we might use rods for web members um, on lightly loaded trusses that are fairly shallow so that the rods are not very long. So this shows some examples. These are roof trusses, uh, double angle top cord, double angle bottom cord, and in this case, zigzagging rods to form the web members connecting them together. You'll notice that there's a classic configuration here where the top cord continues over the top of whatever the structural element is that it's bearing on and there's something that mediates between the top cord and this web, this last web, to allow the loads to get delivered to the top, in this case, of this wide flange girder. You'll also notice uh, some elements here, which are called bottom cord extensions, and they are there to brace the bottom flange of this beam against kicking out under the loads. Uh, I might mention while I'm here that this is not an uncommon configuration. The girder is more heavily loaded and can be more economically made with a beam, but these very, very lightly loaded joists are almost always more economically made with trusses. And in fact, typically this truss will be half the weight of whatever a solid web beam would be uh, that would support that same load. This shows uh, an end bearing assembly where the double angle top cord is coming in to the bearing wall. Uh, in this case there's a wood nailer piece on the top to mediate with the wood decking above. This is a pretty uncommon kind of situation. Usually we'd have metal decking welded or nailed to the double angle top cord. Um, I actually showed this slide just to emphasize a certain point that these end bearing assemblies are in modules of two and a half, five, seven and a half, and ten inches. And the reasoning for that is that in the early days these trusses were often used in bearing walls made out of brick or um, concrete masonry units and typically the basic module for the brick would be two and a half inches and seven and a half inches for the CMU unit. So the whole idea was this end bearing assembly has a modular uh, dimension that's consistent with the use in masonry walls. We use them most of the time in other situations now, but nonetheless we still honor those same modules of a depth of two and a half inches, five inches, seven and a half inches, and so forth. Uh, this is just a close-up. Shows a little bit more of that end bearing assembly where the intersection point of this web and the top cord occurs right over the center of half of the flange. So in other words, sometimes we have these end bearing assemblies where we just offset the trusses for each other from each other and the end bearing assembly is centered over the web. But in this case, this top cord lines up with that top cord and they are having to share the top flange of this beam, which means the center of action of this end bearing assembly of this truss is right down the center line of this half of the flange. Uh, 
So the intersection point or the so-called working point where the centroid of the top cord and this last web occurs right about there. Um, this shows a similar kind of truss. In this case, instead of coming to bear on a beam, we have some beams here that probably were incorporated for because of a need for some greater level of clearance at this location. But then we do um, deeper uh, truss girders for the rest of the structure. You'll notice the truss girders are heavier. Uh, they're mostly double angle web members because of the higher loads. These joists, which are supporting very little load from the roof, um, basically have solid rod webs. And again, I emphasize that solid rods would be the least structurally efficient form that we could uh, pick, but because these are not very long and they're not very heavily loaded, and because solid rod is one of the least expensive uh, structural forms that we have in steel, um, this turns out to be a pretty economical way to do this truss. This is a slightly closer view. You'll notice the end bearing assemblies of all these joist truss, trusses have to land on a vertex point of the truss girder. So there's a, a certain pattern here. We have to make this truss girder where the vertices are spaced at whatever we want the spacing of these truss joists to be. This is a slightly closer view. And again, you'll notice they've started to put into place these uh, elements here. They're called bottom cord extensions for this particular joist. And they basically are welded first to the end of this double angle uh, bottom cord, but also welded there and there to avoid rotation about that point. And then the strut comes down and braces the bottom cord of this truss girder. So we see the symbiotic relationship that we often try and cultivate in structures where this truss girder is supporting the truss joists against gravitational loads and the truss joists are returning the favor by bracing the bottom cord of the truss girder against snapping to the side or buckling out from underneath the load. You'll notice another interesting pattern here, and I think we have a close-up of this in a subsequent uh, image, but the in-bearing assemblies of these girders are sharing the plate on the top of the column, and then the truss joist sits on top. So the in-bearing assembly of the truss joist sits on top of the in-bearing assemblies of the truss girders. Okay, so this uh, shows the fabrication process going on in a fabrication shop. This is Volcraft down in Florence, South Carolina. And these slides are probably about 25 years old, so some of this process may have been updated somewhat, but this is pretty much how it's done. This is called a welding table. It's, it's a six or eight inch thick slab of steel it has a flat machined top so that they have good accuracy in laying these things out and they know they're flat. Um, in this case, what they'll do is they'll lay out the truss laying flat, they'll tack weld it together, and then they'll lift it up in this vertical position and uh, go to complete the welding of it. Um, it's a very rapid process. Uh, typically, while I was there, it seemed like there were about 10 of these welders swarming around this welding table at any given time. And they might have uh, three or four or five of these vertical trusses there that they're finishing off before they lift them off the welding table. This is a spool of welding wire. This spool was three or four feet in diameter. Every welder has his own welder and his own spool. Um, and as you can tell, 
they're tooled up to make this stuff in huge quantities. Uh, might also add that they're unbelievably efficient. Um, these trusses are fabricated and sold at a per pound weight that's comparable to a rolled steel section. So in other words, all this labor that's done by these welders uh, on this welding table essentially is done so efficiently that it does not raise the cost of the structure on a per pound basis. Now I'll show you this slide to point out that this welding process is never perfectly symmetric and the welding tends to cause some warping. So you'll notice um, in this case these trusses are upside down and we're looking at the bottom cords uh, as the trusses are just resting on the floor. But we have a considerable amount of wiggle in the bottom of this. And likewise, if we were looking at the top cord, we would see, if we turned these over, we'd see a significant amount of wiggle in the top cord also. The last thing you want is a top cord member that's in compression and that is not straight. So this sort of raises a red flag until you realize that almost always the top cord of these trusses, which is in compression, is stabilized by welding or nailing the steel decking down to the top of it. So these things are very, very well braced against lateral buckling. And so even as crooked as they are, they work really fine. Um, so this shows a few. Um, this looks like a really crooked tr uh, truss also, but it turns out this was deliberate. One of the things you can do on the welding table is you can introduce a curve. So in this case, we have a top cord which crowns right around the center, which happens to be right there. That doesn't look like the center, but it is. Um, and because of the perspective issue, we're not seeing accurately dimensions here. But this portion can be flat, and that portion can be flat, and we can have a little crown at the center. Or we can give this a continuous gentle curvature. The key thing is this truss was designed to assure that it always has positive runoff for the rain. Um, so there are lots of things we can do to manipulate the shape of the top and bottom cord. Um, and it's pretty easy to bend these thin members. And then once all these webs are welded in, the structure becomes super rigid and holds its shape. Uh, here we have another uh, view of one of these trusses. We've got some bracing elements across here. One there, one there, and one there. Those bracing elements are keeping the bottom cords from kicking out um, under load. Those elements have to go to something really rugged like a good column or a, or a very thick bearing wall uh, in order to serve their function of stabilizing the bottom cords. It doesn't, it's not satisfactory to just link this bottom cord to that one and then to the next one because they can all buckle basically in the same direction. Uh, again, I show this slide to show how, what poor quality sometimes, this truss for example, you notice has a huge curvature in the top cord and a fair amount of curvature in the bottom cord. They basically put it in place and nail down the decking and declared it done and it's still a pretty good structure but visually it's kind of sad and uh, normally I wouldn't want to look at something this crooked or this poorly made. Which brings me to this structure. This is the national headquarters of the Body Shop Corporation which you may be familiar with from uh, their stores in the mall. They sell soaps and lotions and various things. This is a space that's 300 feet long by about 70 feet across. And I did a retrofit to produce a, a monitor in the center of the space with vertical glass facing north and south. And fortunately, this building was oriented correctly so that we had true north and south exposure. 
and with some moderate, modest overhang on the south facing glass, we were able to keep the beam sun out, sunlight out during the summertime. But all of this structure was designed to have a hung ceiling underneath it. It's classic sort of standard double angle steel trusses. They're pretty crooked. They've got a whole slew of uh, bracing elements up there. And from my point of view, I thought it was kind of sloppy construction and a lot of visual noise. So one of the things I did after the building was built, I went and interviewed some of the people who work in this space. And one of my questions was, um, did the crookedness or the poor quality of the steel construction above bother them? And of the 15 or so people I talked to, every single one of them looked at me like they had no idea what I was talking about and they'd never looked up at the steel anyway. So what that tells you is you can have some pretty rough and inaccurate construction and the average person doesn't tend to notice it too much. What the people did notice in this space was they really liked the daylighting and compared to uh, previous behavior uh, in this space when there was a hung ceiling and no aperture up above, it was a really dark and depressing space. So having this uh, steel exposed uh, turned out to be a really good thing in the sense that it let the light through and greatly enhanced the space. Okay, so this shows uh, some rod material which has been bent into this zigzag or W shape. Um, you can do many of these if you wanted to. You could keep this going on, but if you make this zigzag element too long, it becomes too floppy and too hard to handle. So uh, this seems to be the preferred way to do it where they make this W shape um, and then they weld enough at the connection point to make sure that forces get transferred through at the next joint. Uh, this is what that looks like in, in sort of typical construction. Um, you'll notice they have to get the, the, the welder up between these two angles. Uh, sometimes that's kind of difficult to do. The quality of the weld isn't great, but the loads on it is not, are not too great either. You'll notice some spatter around here. That's where they touch the rod down um, or the wire down to get the, the arc started. Um, so this kind of spatter and, and poor weld quality or at least visual uh, quality is sort of standard or par for the course for this. It's a very simple, very economical very efficient structural element. This is a single angle. This person is working at a shear where the shear is computer run. So basically uh, this angle is run through, it's sheared, and in the new configuration it's sheared and immediately mashed. And by mashed I mean that the standard spacing between the the two angles on the top cord and the two angles on the bottom cord is an inch. So this dimension or that dimension right there is basically one inch. So here you have your standard angle and then the end is mashed to get a consistent dimension. And the reason you want to do that is uh, your web forces may vary substantially over the length of the truss. Some of the web forces might be uh, very heavily loaded and involve uh, fairly heavy and wide angles. Others might be lightly loaded and by mashing the ends you you develop a consistent width to these elements which then means they can share the same one inch gap between the two angles of the top cord and the same one inch gap between the two angles of the bottom cord. So this is what a truss like that looks like in this case. In every case, we've got single angles. And by the way, single angles are not great, but they're better uh, in, than solid rod in terms of strength, as we learned when we looked at our uh, yellow um, plastic angles 
uh, in the column experiments that we did earlier. So these angles now are replacing the solid rods that we saw in the uh, previous images. And now when we get to really heavily loaded trusses, we start using double angles that then get welded on the outside faces of the cord members. So this is the bottom cord. This is one of the angles. Here's a web member that's welded on the outside of it. And then there's a web member welded on the outside of the other angle in this double angle bottom cord. And then the spacing between these double angles is maintained by this single angle which has been mashed on the end. This is what we call the end bearing assembly. Um, in this case this dimension is 5 inches and the end bearing assembly has been produced. Here we have a 2.5 inch um, leg on the angle of the top cord and a piece of that same dimension, two and a half inches, has been cut to make this portion of the end bearing assembly and they've just been butt welded together along that seam to produce an overall dimension of five inches. Sometimes we we want, uh, depending on the dimension of these, we can't, we can't always make this work where we just butt them together. Um, so sometimes we lap them. So here we have like about an inch and a half double angle on the top and then about a three quarter inch extension, which is, gives us an, I mean a one inch dimension right here. And the overall dimension of this is two and a half inches. In this case, we have an end web, which is double angle, so it's welded on the outside face. And then we have the, the angles of this end bearing assembly welded on the inside faces of the double angle of the top cord. In this case, we have a single angle web that's coming up between the double angle of the top cord. So the seat angles have been welded on the outside face of the double angle top cord. These are all variations, all designed to get an end bearing surface here uh, with a dimension from there to there that's one of these modular dimensions of two and a half inches or five inches or seven and a half inches. One of the beauties to these overlapping uh, angles for the end bearing assembly is that they can actually be rotated. So these trusses are intended to be sloped rafter like elements and you'll notice this end bearing assembly has been fabricated at an angle and that one's fabricated at an angle. So this could sit on top of a low wall and this on a higher bearing wall or we might have a lower beam that supports this end and a higher beam that supports that end. So I'm coming back to this to point out some common kinds of details. Um, this bottom cord is lapping around a fin there. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I don't have a close-up of that, but basically this fin might be used to make a moment connection to the truss, so there'll be connection top and bottom, or sometimes the fin is just designed to keep this bottom cord from kicking out, so it's an additional bracing element for that bottom cord and which it is depends on uh, the strategy that's being used in the particular design. In this particular building, there, there are shear walls all around it for lateral stabilization, so it seems unlikely that this is intended as any kind of moment connection. And when you look up at a structure like that, you'll see daylight on both sides of that fin uh, and no weld between the bottom um, cord of the truss and that fin. I want you to notice some other things here. The, um, 
The girder truss at the ends has double angles because those are very heavily loaded. All of these vertical elements, as we discussed before, are not a primary part of the spanning. They're just supporting a little section of top cord. So every one of those vertical elements is just a single angle. Here we have a double angle for a heavily loaded tension member. This is a double angle because it's heavily loaded, but also it's in compression and we want to be able to resist buckling. By the time we get to the next tension element, which is this one right here, the loads are down enough that they felt comfortable making that a single angle. So here we have a double angle tension member, then a single angle tension member, then a smaller single angle temp tension member. And this member is symmetric to that one, and that member is symmetric to that one. So again, all the vertical elements are lightweight, single angles because they're lightly loaded and every once in a while we break with the pattern of the double angles and we go with a single angle when it's in tension and we know the force is not too great. Okay, so here we have uh, that same pattern again. A single angle supporting a small section of roof. Double angles as part of the the major load carrying elements in this Warren truss. Here we have tiny little uh, truss joists with solid rod webs coming to bear on the joints of the truss girder, which is a structure. And then you'll notice again we have elements coming down from the truss joist to brace the bottom of the truss girder. So these long elements that have to go way up to those uh, truss joists are to stabilize this bottom point on the truss girder so that the truss girder doesn't kick out from under the load. Okay, again, uh, this double angle just slides around this fin. The fin then helps st stabilize that bottom cord against kicking out. We have a similar kind of detail here keep this bottom cord from kicking out. Here we have the end bearing assembly of the truss girder coming to bear on half of this column. The end bearing assembly of the other truss girder coming to bear on the other half of the column. And then the end bearing assembly of this truss joist straddling those two end bearing assemblies of the truss girders. This would be a kind of standard detail. And here again, we see it where this is uh, in the building on Hillsborough Street, which currently houses Chipotle. And if you go there and you look up, you'll see there's no weld. These two angles are just straddling this fin as a way to keep from uh, the bottom cord of the truss from kicking out under load. This is a slightly less conventional detail, but it points out something. We don't almost never want to deviate from our end bearing assembly. That's the standard truss assembly. In this case, we wanted our uh, beam girder that's coming to this location to uh, be able to share this column with this truss girder. And so in the detailing, what they've done is they've cut away part of the flange, top flange of this beam, and part of the web, and they've created this seat. So here we have an angle that's welded on to create the seat, and then another angle here that's welded to basically stiffen the web where, where the beam's been cut. And what they're doing is they're basically then welding a stiffener plate on each side. So in essence, they're turning this portion of the beam into a column, which is an extension or continuation of this tubular column. Um, so all this stuff has been designed to create a seat that this end bearing assembly can now come in and occupy. And that may sound like a lot of trouble, but it turns out it's not that difficult to do.
and it's easier than probably anything else we can think of and that's why it's detailed in this way. Okay, now we often want to create an overhang and, and we don't want to break with our tradition of the end bearing assembly here. So what we do is we continue the top cord all the way out and then we take the end bearing assembly and rather than just have it be like five inches of angle turned upside down, we continue the angle all the way in past this major joint and continue it all the way out and we weld that angle continuously along there so that the two angles basically create a channel and that channel uh, is then back to back with this other channel and that allows us to get up to six feet of overhang with a five inch deep end bearing assembly. This is another view it shows a truss like that coming out and cantilevering here and all this decking is going in this direction to span from truss to truss or from one top cord extension to the next top cord extension. When we get out here though we want to cantilever in two directions so in this case we've taken a simple 5 inch deep I-beam and run it across here and run it continuously across there. So it's behaving a whole lot like this uh, top cord extension except it's a true I section and we have to run it far enough that it's balanced on top of this beam and then we stabilize it against this uh, truss here. And then all the decking here has to run in this direction because it's spanning from I-beam to I-beam. And then you'll notice the corners are a special case. Um, we have the opportunity to put in these kickers, which basically are giving us a truss-like action to support these two points. You would think we'd do that under this corner piece, but it turns out there's a fairly deep fascia plate here that allows the loads to be carried back as a cantilever to here so this beam is supported by that beam, which is then supported by that strut. Um, we're returning to this just to make a point that we touched on earlier, but to make it more emphatic. Trusses like this, to keep them from kicking out under the load, we need to brace them. In this case, we're bracing them with this and that and that and those elements tie back into some very stable part of the structure. Another common way to do it is to use this cross bracing periodically uh, between all the trusses. Um, if you've got a place to tie it back to, this is cheaper and simpler to implement, but often this gets tied back to cross bracing like this at some point in the system. So you can use a combination where you have some of this cross bracing and then periodically run these linear elements from bottom cord to bottom cord. That ends our video on the fabrication of standard steel trusses, which are parallel cord steel trusses with double angle top cords and double angle bottom cords. And for web members, they may be rods, single angles, or double angles.